Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Humanities Institute event. Um, I'm Yuval of Noor, Director of the Humanities Institute here at Scripps College, uh, and we're very glad you could join us. Uh, this year's theme, uh, A Broader History of Thought, explores non-European influence thought uh, on its own terms. Um, just a note about the format, uh, our guest will speak for a while, and then we'll have some time for discussion. Uh, panelists, you can just unmute and ask questions as you wish. Uh, audience, please um, feel free to type in any questions you might have along the way uh, in the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you should see it, and I can uh, read your question out for you uh, when the time comes. And now let me introduce today's speaker. Chad Hansen is uh, Chair Professor of Chinese Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Hong Kong. He's lived in Hong Kong on and off for almost three decades. His research has focused on Chinese theory of language and logic, how the concepts used in understanding language and the Shin heart mind informed classical Chinese ethical discourse and Taoism. He's author of books on these topics, including Language and Logic in Ancient China, The Taoist Theory of Chinese Thought, and Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, uh, The Art of Harmony. He is past president of the Australasian Society of Asian and Comparative Philosophy and former chair of the Board of the Faculty of Arts and the, of the Department of Philosophy at Hong Kong University. Before coming to University of Hong Kong, he was professor and university scholar at the University of Vermont and has also held visiting positions at universities around the world, including Stanford, UCLA, Michigan, Pittsburgh, Hawaii, and the National University of Singapore. It's an honor to have a true sage, Professor Chad Hansen with us today. Welcome to Hong Kong, everyone. Uh, I don't know about the sage part, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about how, well, just the world that I've been navigating for the last 30 years, or for that matter, for the last 60. I started coming to Hong Kong in about 1961, and um, I'm, I'm totally committed to learning from China and happy to share that with you. And what I wanted to talk about today is the notion of Tao and the philosophy religion we call Taoism. And the core question is what Taoism is and what Tao is. And I want to start here by focusing instead on what we believe just briefly, because one of the things that we believe is in beliefs. And a question I start with is, do I or should I believe in beliefs? Do I believe that beliefs exist? Well, I'm actually not quite convinced of that, partly because when I look at ancient Chinese thought, I don't find a concept of belief. And also because we've been doing neurophysiology for some 50 years now, and no one has ever found a belief anywhere in the brain. At the same time, I believe there must be a lot of beliefs, at least millions of them, because I can recite and compose millions of sentences. So for now, let me set aside that kind of belief, the belief that corresponds to a sentence that's called belief that, or a propositional belief. I wanna focus instead on another conception of belief that I call believing in. And the idea is that believing in and believing that don't have to be exactly the same thing. When I believe that, I have this thing in my mind that's supposed to correspond to some object out there. So if I believe that God exists, then I believe that it's a fact out there in the world that there's a God somehow. But believing in God is way more than that. Believing in God is living my life as if there were this supremely rational 
being who was kind of like me, except omnipotent and omniscient and created the whole world and has this plan and made the moral laws for me so that I can live and follow and carry out his plan. That's believing in God, as opposed to merely believing that God exists. Now, that kind of belief is almost non-existent in ancient China. And when we classify religions, one of the old ways of doing that classification is to divide them into types. And one type is the type called prophetic, in which spirituality is essentially the same as your capacity to believe something. That's why we think of religion as a faith. It's what you can believe even without evidence. That kind of religion was almost non-existent in ancient China. And well, I should say, when I say ancient China, I'm talking about China before the introduction of Buddhism, because Buddhism actually brings in that kind of belief. Islam came to China too, and so did Christianity at later periods in Chinese history. And I'm interested in that way the Chinese masters, the Confucius and Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, how they were talking and thinking before that, sep that system that looks more like us uh, came into China. And what I learned almost as soon as I came to China in 1961, so I wanted to go out, the, the, thing, the thing I'm teaching and talking about is sometimes called Chinese thought. And so I'd go into a bookstore here and I'd look for the section on Chinese thought and I'd almost never find it. And I discovered that if I wanted to find Chinese thought, I would have to go to this section, which is identified with these two characters. I don't know how many of you know uh, China, uh, Chinese characters, but this is teaching and learning. And instead of talking about beliefs and desires, what was going on in China is they were talking about teaching and learning. I'm gonna take my laser pointer out. I've lost control of my cursor. Ah, there it is, thank you. Uh, so what we don't find in China, as I said, was you don't find this concept of belief and the whole way of thinking about human psychology that we philosophers call belief desire psychology. It's that view of psychology that makes sense when you think of explaining a belief by, I mean, explaining behavior by a belief and a desire. In China, the explanation of behavior at that period was by teaching and learning. What have you been taught and what have you learned? Notice the difference is that our system, our way of thinking about these matters makes it all very individual psychology. It's all going on up here in my brain. Whereas in that Chinese one, it becomes sociological. It's a transmission of information across generations. It puts my teacher, my father, my older brother into an important role. This kind of conception can help us with a second way of characterizing religions. Now, this second one is called ritual religions because they identify spirituality not with your capacity to believe, but with your performance. And the notion that is now being used for belief in modern Chinese was understood in ancient China to be about the reliability. How trustworthy were you in performing these things that you have been trained and learned to do? It's a kind of social public behavior. And Confucianism is a standard paradigm model of this kind of religion. By the way, within Western religions, Judaism and Catholicism are a bit more like this because they put relatively more emphasis on sacraments or on traditions and on rituals. Um, you can find a lot of atheist Jewish people, people who say they don't believe in God, but are nonetheless, they, do, they go through all of the rituals, they wear the hat. It's possible to be very ritualistic, even within Western religions. Confucianism is purely that. It's all about the ritual. And when you do the ritual, when you go through the behaviors, you do it with, and here we find a character, once again, character that is identified 
translate, it's a way that we translate the Western words like spirit or God. Um, now, it has kind of always been sort of interesting to me. I always have to move to get my cursor back whenever I do that. So I need to be careful about it. There we go. It's always been interesting to me that people who deal in translation often fall into a trap that uh, I learned from my son way back when I was a postdoc at Stanford. We, were go we, we lived in the, the Stanford graduate community. So I sent my son to a kindergarten, a kind of preschool actually, that was very international because Stanford has got all these people coming from all over the world. So he comes back from preschool uh, sometime early, like in the second or third day, because they'd been introducing each other and talking about their language and their beliefs. And he came back and he said, Daddy, you know what I figured out? And I said, okay, what is it? And he said, English is the only real language. And I said, oh, and why is that? And he says, well, because every other language means something in English. And I call this, I, when, when I wrote my first book, I called this the English is the only real language fallacy because we often talk that way as if what you're doing in Chinese is finding a way to express English thoughts. And that's what I want to warn you against. We're going to try and find a way uh, around doing that. So we'll look at these two characters and we think of these as a Chinese concept and it functions to talk about the way I carry out my ritual behaviors, the reliability, the intelligence I bring to it. I actually like to think of it as mostly something like sapiens. We are homo sapiens. We have we have sapiens. We are bundles of chi. Some of you who are studying Chinese rec may recognize this character. This is the stuff that makes up the universe. We are living embodiments of chi that is sapient, that's awake, alive, creative, focused as we carry out our behaviors in this actual world. That's more like the Chinese view. Sorry, let me get my, there we go. The third type in this venerable typology of religions is called mystical. And the interesting thing about mystical religions is nobody knows what they are because they are mystical. That is to say, they are mysteries. But we do know that they are neither of the other two. They're not prophetic and they're not ritual. They don't have commitment to anybody of beliefs. There are no fixed beliefs, no things you have to believe by faith. And there are no rituals. That was the, the Taoists are quite opposed in this sense to Confucianism with its traditional transmitted historical rituals that you carry out generation after generation after generation. But they are sapient. They are focused on their knowing, their creativity, how their energy moves through a world of energy, how we, how our body moves through a physical world, natural world space, how chi moves through chi. So Taoism is a different kind of mysticism. If you think that mysticism is about this experience, something that's in your mind, like you have this sudden awareness and this awareness is something related to God, then, then don't think of Taoism as mysticism because it's not like that. The sense of Taoist mysticism is just an intensity that you bring into life. It's living that life, this physical, actual life to the fullest. So it's a kind of mysticism without a God, without the notion of experience, without the notion of belief, and without any commitment to continuous constant ritual. Instead, you're in a world that is constantly changing in front of you. And you're in it in a different place from where I am. And the Tao's that are open to you, the way you would get out of this room into the living room or in to get a drink is different from the way I would. Depends on where you are. It's relative to your situation. It's particular. And there's no one who knows better than you where your way lies. So this is a religion. We often speak this way. This is a religion of nature. And it's a religion of the paths in nature and the guidance that you get from nature and the intelligence you bring to getting that guidance out of nature. So is Tao a mystical entity? 
Well, in a sense, I will talk a little bit later about the ways it can become very mystical. It can seem very mystical, and you can talk about it in mystical ways because of the skepticism, because of the particularism, and because it doesn't believe there are any authorities. It's going to be hard to find easy, clear answers. So the answer is always going to be shrouded in a certain amount of unknown. And Tao, as a way of understanding the structure of life, leads us very often to the notion to the to the notion that's in physics and mathematics of chaos. The, the physical mathematical notion of chaos is if I change one little variable in a very small way, it can have a huge impact on the whole system. Taoism has that kind of conception of chaos in it. Little things I do can make a very, very big difference. But otherwise, what I want to do is make Taoism clear and easy. I don't want to mystify you. So aside from saying, yes, there are ways of talking about Tao that will get us to chaos and mystery, let's start with a simple answer, an answer that you not only can believe in, but you probably already do believe in. The notion of Tao is just the notion of a path. There's a pathway, a roadway, a highway, a byway. We have the very, very same word, literally, in English. In virtually every language, you are going to have a metaphor of Tao's or ways, of paths, because that's an almost totally universal human conception. But for us, the concept of way almost never forms the focus of a philosophy. We talk about it almost, it just gets thrown away, gets tagged onto the end of words, gets used in all over in our writing, and yet no one ever points to it and says, oh, we're talking about ways. The issue in Taoism is not belief, not thought, but these ways, these ways that are in the world. And it recognizes it's much more because it comes up in the same context as Confucianism. It is much more about a kind of sociology. What we're talking about when we talk about Tao in this way is what philosophers now call normativity. And normativity is just a longer, more complicated word for ethics or morality. But we like to use it because when we talk about this, we usually do it in a high level class called a meta ethics class. And what we're doing today is in a way, literally Chinese meta ethics, but meta ethics in the West is very, very difficult. And part of the reason it's difficult is because you have a different conception of normativity to start with. So I want to give you the way that the Taoists would talk about metaethics, how to talk about the question of where does life guidance come from? How do I find it? What, what gives it the status it has as good guidance? And I want to talk about it in ways that draw from the Tao Te Ching. Now, the Tao Te Ching is made up of these characters, the characters we talked about before. The Tao character is the one that means path. And I will come to Da in a second. We see it first in this text attributed to Lao Tzu. Yes, I am able to do that. And here is a picture of Lao Tzu. This, of course, is a realistic photograph. This is exactly what he looked like. Um, and he was followed by Zhuang Tzu. These were the two philosophers from ancient China who started this thought system that we think of as Taoism. But unlike usual times of talking about Taoism, I'm not going to focus only on them because Taoism continued throughout the entire history of Chinese thought as a kind of other, an alternative to, to Confucianism. And Taoism blended with Buddhism, introduced Buddhism. It became very welcoming to Buddhism when Buddhism was introduced into China and produced a particularly or uniquely Taoist or Chinese version of Buddhism, which we call Zen. It's actually called Chan Buddhism in Mandarin Chinese and Sim Buddhism. We call it Sim here in Canton, in Cantonese, because we speak these different Chinese languages. But after Buddhism, Taoism was the first one 
to welcome Western logic and science. The ancient Chinese philosophers had not invented logic and science was something new to them. And the first person to advocate really seriously and the one who was most effective in introducing logic and science into China was a Taoist named Yan Fu from the 19th century. And he was a fan of the Tao Te Ching and also a fan of evolution. And a lot of Confucians look at this and say, Yin Fu is not a really a Taoist because he believes in evolution and Taoists didn't believe in evolution. But Yin Fu looks at evolution. What is that? It is a natural Tao. It's a Tao of how we, and for that matter, ants and horses and other things got here. And then a few years later, Jin Yuelin was a student of Bertrand Russell, the Western scientific philosopher who was an atheist. And still later, you have Hu Shi, for, for me, was the real introduction that got me doing Chinese philosophy, because he wrote a book about how logic and Chinese philosophy blend together. He was a student of John Dewey, and also someone who was interested in science, in democracy, in liberty, and freedom, and that doesn't make them not a Taoist. And then my own teacher, who's very interested in Nietzsche, the one I, I studied with him in Taiwan. And I tell you this, not just to claim authority, but to remind you that a lot of people will say, these people are not Taoists. Taoists are these religious mystics who hang out in temples. And I want to tell you, look, there is a big tradition here. And there are people who are in temples. But we're going to be talking now about that Taoism, that broad conception that can include and does include uh, science and includes it whether or not the Confucian authoritarians think we should include it or not. Obviously, uh, to be honest, I mean, I think you can now pick up that there are different interpretations. And this particular interpretation of Taoism that I'm giving you will be controversial because there are a lot of people who study Chinese thought who will say, no, that is not the correct way of understanding Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi. And so one of the issues that I've had to wrestle with for all of the, since I came in 1961, so all the years I've been dealing with this interface between Western and Chinese thought is the question of meaning and interpretation. What is a correct interpretation. What is the meaning of this text that I'm reading? And what I have come to, I can go through a list of all the different theories of meaning that I've studied and try and convince you of my final position, but rather I would like to just use it as a way of introducing and just see how well it works to help you understand the meaning of Taoism. And the basic idea that I've come to is meaning is metaphor. And, and that itself is a, this meaning is like a metaphor. That's even a metaphorical conception of meaning. But what we think in what modern metaphor theory goes like this, there are these things that I know very intimately. And notice we go right back, why I like this for Taoism, go right back to the body. I know these things because I know how to move my body in a space. I know them in the ways that I know living rather than the ways that I know language. And somehow I bring language and my ordinary living, my bodily inhabitation of this body in this space into understanding language. And the way I think that we do this, basically, is that we assign words from our local language, our natural language, to parts of this bodily experience that are familiar. And then these terms have a, play a role in something that makes a lot of sense to us. And when that ma makes sense to us, we can take that word and use it in another role to talk about something else, something more abstract or something more distant, or something more general. So metaphors are bodily behaviors that I can use to say something that helps you think of it as like that bodily behavior that you know really well. Let me try some examples. Um, let me introduce a distinction between social metaphors and natural metaphors. You may have 
picked up or guessed that I am an American. I was born and grew up in America, and I taught at the university. Nobody here has any trouble telling, by the way. Uh, my accent is very, very clear to anyone here that this is an American speaking. But I taught at Pittsburgh. And at Pittsburgh, as you can imagine, I could use a baseball metaphor anytime I wanted. In fact, the highest level, most difficult abstract texts in linguistic theory use baseball metaphors all the way through them. So I could say something like that semantic theory is way out in left field and all my students would understand me. And then I came to Hong Kong. And for 30 years, I cannot use baseball metaphors. Nobody here understands it. That's a social metaphor because your ability to understand it is not just your having played the game as I did as a boy, but also on it being a game that is played in your society. It's like it being a language that works in your society. That's why Wittgenstein has, thinks of it as a game theory. If that's the way you think of metaphors, then metaphors can be as dependent on culture as language itself is. But I think that we can also focus on certain natural metaphors, metaphors that no matter what culture you're in, there must be such a metaphor. And path and walking a path and being on a path seems to me to be that kind of metaphor. And what's interesting when I look at the ancient prehistory in China as told in Chinese histories and ancient prehistory in the West as told in Western histories, I see this very interesting contrast. In the West, we think that there is a natural development in fact, anthropologists almost have it as an article of faith that when a society gets large and complex enough, they are going to go from tribal uh, elders and tribal chiefs to a king with laws. And you have the rule of law as a way of holding a kingdom together. And we talk about Hammurabi and his law code and Hammurabi is claiming his authority from God, either because he is God or is the descendant from God or has received the authority from God, but somehow God gets involved in it. Because if you have law and punishment and guilt as the metaphor for understanding normativity, you're going to have to have some kind of authority of the person who passes that law who makes, who promulgates it, who writes it down and makes it actually binding on you such that it's right to punish you for disobeying it. That's one kind of authority. We call it sometimes in philosophy, performative authority, because you, there's this person who by his performance can create normative requirements. In China, that was not the way they talked about the Duke of Zhou, or rather talked about King Wan and King Wang. The Duke of Zhou introduced a theory according to which the leaders of Chinese society, and by the way, it was just as widespread and, and extensive and just as successful as an ancient culture, but it didn't have that concept of law. Instead, it continued to operate with the hunter-gatherer concept of a path, but it worked out the detail of how to use that path metaphor, path and following a path to food, to water, to get back home. So it doesn't have a natural justification of law or guilt, punishment, and the idea that are so common in our way of talking about normativity. For them, norms are DAOs. And when you follow a norm, it's called Xing. You walk that DAO. And so Xing, walking, becomes a metaphorical concept for any kind of conduct or behavior or activity in life. Chinese characters are themselves structured as metaphors. We sometimes call them ideographs. And I'll warn you, there are people who think I shouldn't use that word, but I'm going to go ahead and I'll show you why I think we can go ahead and use that. We can think of Chinese characters as themselves ideographs and we can use the 
idea structure, the metaphorical structure to understand the other word in our discussion of Chinese normativity. And that is the word da. Um, you probably have heard of this. If you were um, ever introduced to the Tao of Pooh, you probably, if you liked it, went out and read the Da of Piglet. These two concepts go together. And I want to show you how they go together metaphorically. Oh, now it won't click because I'm in my, I'm in my description mode. There we go. Oops. I have to go back and change it from a pointer. Sorry about this. I'm going to go back to being my take that off. Now I can click that. These are ancient forms of Chinese characters. The Chinese characters had an evolution, just like humans and other things have an evolution. The top row here is the character for walk, the one I showed you before. And it was originally just this kind of thing. You can just literally see there's a path here and paths that come into it becomes a kind of crossroad path, gets stylized and written so you can do it very nicely with a pen and ends up in the modern printed form that you saw on the screen just a moment ago. This is the character for one of the words that is attached to this activity, this behavioral activity of finding a path choosing a path and following a path. The following part is walking it. The finding it is indicated in the notion of da. Here again, you have the path structure and you have a very obvious eye and a direction. So the eye is finding your direction, seeing the path and looking out there, picking it up and following it. And then in a still later version, slightly more stylized, the path has become an intersection, so you have a decision to make. The eye is stylized. The path and walking are still symbolized. And what you have over here is a three-chambered heart. Yes, the Chinese were doing dissection on cadavers, and they knew about the heart. And they very obviously indicated it quite visually. And here we have a still later version, even more stylized. And finally, we get the version that we find today in the text. That's very much like the modern version of this character for Da. And what I want to say about this character and about the meaning that we see in that structure is that what you will find almost all the time in your English translations, remember English is not the only real language, but what you'll find there is something we all find familiar in a religion and in ethics, and that is the notion of virtue. But you would be misled if you take that seriously because virtue is like that mystical experience and like thoughts and beliefs, they're inside the head. It's all in you and your virtue comes out in your behavior. Da is not like that. Da is like virtuosity. It's your capacity to interact with the world in a way that finds guidance there and successfully follows it. You're a virtuoso when you do that really well. Yo-Yo Ma doesn't merely have virtue. He has virtuosity because he can find that music and play it in a way that makes it extremely successful. Those are the three core concepts linked to this metaphorical way of understanding natural guidance, understanding natural ethics. And to these three, we add Ren, Tian, and Da, human, natural, and great. So let's take a look at those. First distinction between human Daos and nature's Tao's. I've kind of talked about this already when I talked about the difference between baseball and walking a path. A human Tao is basically what Confucianism was talking about. Confucian, Confucians and their opponents, the Moas, make up what Zhuangzi called the Ru Mo. And it is all about human Tao. And the Taoists are suspicious of human Tao in certain ways. Uh, my 
friend Chen Xinyi, a graduate of our university here, by the way, uh, was here talking to some of you uh, at the, in the first semester. And I'm sure she would have talked about Confucianism because that's what she really does and likes. And it is about roles and responsibilities. And the way we think of this human Tao is you have a named role, student, I have a named role, professor, and we play a ritual behavior where each of us does something related to our role. We are performing our roles. The entire structure of a social civilization is made up of these kinds of conventions where there are players and practices, institutions that have roles for named things. And one of the important elements here is that language is itself a human Tao. It is a social convention. And we play roles. We take turns speaking. We respond to each other by reacting to the content. We have this system of talking and this system of behaving and this system of cooperating, all of which are a human Tao. And that's the reason that we call Confucianism and Moism humanism. They're about that human Tao, that human path, that human way of behaving. And notice that way has already come out of its home in my physical body to become something about all of the social practices, all of the ways of behaving in a, in a social system. Mozart who opposed Confucius, didn't like their conservatism. He wanted to reform this body of human social practices and institutions. And he thought to himself, how am I going to improve it? Because if I'm thinking about improving, I'm thinking about a normative issue. What guidance can I find to make my system of human guidance better? If I'm looking inside the system, I'm just going to be reinforcing it. He said, I think we have to look outside the system of human guidance to tin, to nature, to find out how to improve it. And he thought, go, we won't go into the details here, but he thought that nature loved humans and wanted humans to thrive and do well. And so he thought the way we should reform the system is to agree with nature and make our Ren Dao, our human Dao, one that would be better for everyone concerned, improve our well-being. From the Taoists, it's not so much a question of their disagreeing, they didn't offer a different human Tao. They rather stepped back from this dispute between the Confucians and the Moas. And they tried to look at that dispute and say, what's really going on there? What answers the question about where we get normativity? What are the sources of normativity? And they had a Basically, it's something that's inspired a little bit by Mozart himself. You look to nature. This is what Lao Tzu said. Lao Tzu, the old, that just means old philosopher, by the way. The old philosopher just said the thing to do is you follow nature's Tao exclusively. Don't get caught up in human Tao. That can be wrong in all sorts of ways. Follow natural Tao and only natural Tao. And so he was anti-Confucian and anti-Moist because he understood this thing that the Confucians and Moas both understood about language, that if you're going to get rid of human Tao, then you must also get rid of language. And if you get rid of language, he called that Wu Wei or Wu Wei. You can read that Wei character in two different tones. Wu Wei is you do not act towards something on the basis of the name you assign to it because the name you assign to it is part of your human social Tao. And if you behave toward that thing based on that name, based on that way of putting it into your human system, then you're not reacting to it in its real nature. And he would have thought and would have said, it's really silly for you to be coming into this class worried about an A. You can't eat an A, you can't drink an A, you can't wear an A, it doesn't keep you warm. It isn't going to make you, 
it only has value in a social structure where it contributes to your graduating or getting a job. In other words, it's something that takes place in a system of practices. Lao Tzu says, you know, that's really kind of non-natural. That's kind of phony. That's not really reliable. Now, it turns out that Lao Tzu's view of this natural, this exclusive focus on natural doubt was paradoxical. I happen to think, because I wrote my own translation of the Tao Te Ching, I think Lao Tzu kind of realized it and tried to find ways around it. And that'll just bring us back into the whole question of interpretation. And I have my interpretation. He hints at several of them. It's not easy to say what way he chose around and out of that paradox. But Zhuangzi is famous for the way he got out of the paradox, because he said, look, here's the way to deal with the paradox about language. Because Zhuangzi, those of you who, I know you talked about him last week. I mean, if there was ever a guy who loved language, this was it. And he thought, yeah, language is not unnatural. It is one of many totally natural sounds. There's no real separation of human Tao and nature's Tao. Humans are natural creatures. Our ways of working together are natural ways of working together, just the way an ant's colony's ways of working together are natural, and a bee's colony's ways of working together, and muskox ways of working together. All of those are natural ways of cooperating, and all of them <coughs> involve making some kind of signaling, some kind of noise. Human language happens to be another natural animal sound. He thinks it's, you know, think about birds tweeting. He didn't have... If, if, if Drongzer were alive today, he could pick up any science book on al almost any week and find another example of how we're talking about animals having culture and how bird sounds get put together and how they're beginning to, <clears throat> to understand the grammar and the compositionality of bird sounds. Frogs, nature is filled with sounds. And what I'm doing now is just another natural sound filling the world. It happens because of the way I'm doing it. It's a natural sound that's going out across wires, across the Pacific and coming out in your house and bothering your neighbors, but it's a natural sound. And that is Strong's famous, Strong's famous position. And so when <clears throat> Brian Bruya and Zai Zhu Ching chose to put together this little comic book of Zhuangzi, and by the way, if you can find this, you certainly should. It's a wonderful book and a wonderful way to get into Zhuangzi. He, Brian called this book, called the, the, in, the book, this introduction, the sounds of nature, the music of nature. Zhuangzi's metaphor quite literally is, we are pipes of nature. What I'm doing right now, well, the Confucians and the Moas are both standing out there saying, here I am. I'm speaking from Tien's point of view. I'm speaking for nature. Listen to me. And Zhuangzi is saying, you know what? You're both right. You're both right. Everything we say is part of the pipes or the sounds of nature. There's no reason to make that fundamental distinction. Daos are everywhere in the world, and part of the Tao of the world is many human Daos in many different places with many different noises and many different be forms of behavior. And all of them will give us information and guidance. So we come to the third one, Great Tao. Now, this is the one that's going to get us thinking more about perhaps something like mysticism. It happens in Chinese. Those of you who are studying Chinese will already have noticed this, but one of the things that we struggle with when we start studying Chinese is the fact that Chinese nouns are mostly what we call collective nouns or mass nouns or myriological Latin nouns. Don't worry about the word. All it means is you don't count the noun by itself. You don't say one human. You say one individual of human, one pak of horse, one Check of cow, uh, and so on. You, every single noun is used in the way that we use words like water and wood. You divide the reference by adding something else to them so that they think in fairly large, they think of everything being a sum of things that make it up. So if you can think of my hand as part of me and me as part of the human and 
human as part of mammal and mammal as part of thing and so on, I keep getting a larger and larger thing I talk about. The things we talk about, the things that exist can be summed. And great Tao is just the Tao of the thing that is the sum of everything. We talk in Chinese, you've probably seen the phrase, the 10,000 things. And that's not, doesn't mean 10,000 stars, because even I can tell there are more than 10,000 stars on a good clear night. It's not 10,000 grains of sense. It's 10,000 kinds of nameable things. It's thing kinds that become, you can see again why Taoism would be instantly interested in evolution. It's the story of a thing, how that thing came to be. So Chinese nouns don't have plural. They name these cumulative times. It's natural in Chinese to think of larger and larger holes. There's a psychologist at the University of Michigan where I went to school who's, who is uh, written a book called The Geography of Thought. And he writes about how East Asians, he, I don't know if this is a a, a good experiment or not. I'm not going to vouch for the experiment, but it's an interesting way of capturing this fact about the difference in the way of looking at the world. He claims that when you get an East Asian and you point them at a fish tank and say, tell me something, just tell me a story. The East Asian will always start the story from the outside in, and they will explain things on the basis of what's in the environment. And the Westerner will always start from a fish, start from something in the middle and build out from that. I don't know if that's true, but this is expressing this notion in China, we see ourselves always as parts of larger wholes. The, the idea of an individual is the idea of a part of some bigger whole. And it turns out therefore that you can today draw a picture of great Tao. So if it's mystical, it can at least be pictured. And this picture won a prize in a scientific illustration con contest. And you can see instantly what this picture is a picture of. It is a picture of the Big Bang Theory. And it's the evolution of everything from the beginning of time to now, 13.77 million years ago. That's a picture of great Tao. Talk about great Tao was first introduced according to the Zhuangzi, which has a kind of history of thought in it, by a man named Shan Dao. Shan Dao said, well, look, think about great Tao. Clearly, if Tao is the way I should live, then even a clot of earth, a rock, a blade of grass, everything follows great Tao. Nothing can fail to follow great Tao. You are following great Tao in sitting there listening to me. I am following great Tao in sitting here talking. I don't have to, you don't have to study. Remember, it's all about studying and learning. You don't have to be taught. You don't have to know anything. You will follow great Tao. You can just relax. You can be like a leaf on the river. You just stop making any judgments and float along. You flow with great Tao. Zhuangzi gives us this story from Shen Dao, and he gives it to us before he talks about the, Tao Jing, about the Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. So presumably Lao Tzu agrees with his criticism, but right after giving it, Zhuangzi declares that's a Tao for dead things, not for the living. That's a Tao that doesn't Tao. What does, think about what that means. You come to me for advice, Professor Hansen, what should I study? And say, you, what you ought to study is what you're going to study. You should study what you're going to study. You, uh, wait, that's not very, you're not giving me any advice at all. That's a Tao that doesn't Tao. It doesn't give you a clue about what your guidance is. And finally, it's a Tao that condemns itself, that makes itself, in, in Chinese, we speak about sure and fei, uh, which people who believe in the English is the only real language that means right and wrong. It doesn't actually mean right and wrong. It means this and not that. It's this and not that. They're really indexicals. They're like, they're like pronouns. This and not that. What Shen Dao is saying is not that, notting that. Don't say not that. It reminds me, my... When, when I was 
growing up and as a child got frustrated trying to feed a calf uh, on a cold winter's day. I was out there and the calf wouldn't eat and I was trying to get this calf to drink milk and I was around nine years old and oh, my fingers were freezing and the calf wouldn't help and he butted the milk away and I came in frustrated and I said to my father, I'll, that calf will never learn to drink. And he said, never say never. And I was enlightened. That was when I, uh, that was the Zhuangzi inside. Shandao is saying, don't, don't, don't use don'ts. And so he condemns himself. He, re he rejects himself. So Zhuangzi says, no, we can't do that. We have to think about the fact that we are choosing paths. By we, I mean, well, basically my body. I'm finding a path through this space that I inhabit. But when I find a path for me, it's also a path for my family because they come with me. And the path for me and my family is going to constitute part of the path for the University of Hong Kong's philosophy department. And it's part of the path for philosophy. It becomes part of the path for Hong Kong's development and history, which becomes part of the path of China's development and so on and so on. When I choose a path for me, it automatically becomes a path of everything that I'm a part of. Part of that thing's path is the result of my choosing. So it's not, we think of Taoism it often wants to associate it with Western individualism. No, it's not Western individualism because it's not about this commitment to some kind of a soul or of ego. It's a form of individualism in which I am many individuals. I have many points of view, points of view in the past, points of view in the present, points of view from here and points of view from there. When I choose a point of view, it is one of many possible ways I can look at things. And I can look at them from the point of view of humans. I can look at them from the point of view of my heart or from the point of view of my digestion system. I can be many different points of view. But it still is a form of freedom because when I'm talking about it, it is me, this physical body in this space that's making a choice. Those Physical paths are out there, and I choose them. And this is called in Taoism, ziran. And again, there's an English is the only real language translation. It's almost always rendered as natural. But what it literally means is self-realized, self-soul, self-brought about. When an opportunity, an option, a possibility is out there in the physical world for me to walk. And I choose to walk it. And I have studied and learned. So I'm prepared to walk it successfully. I've got the virtuosity necessary. Then I realize that possibility in nature for all of nature. It is my realizing it. It's not quite, it's related, as you can see, to the word that we translate as freedom, which is self from. And it's not just saying, it is, it's not denying that what I do when I make this choice and follow that Tao is I am choosing from my own past history. It's not about freedom free will in the Western sense. Free will in the Western sense is all about that belief desire psychology. This is about realizing real possibilities in the world. And I can realize a great many of them. But here we can agree with Shun Dao. I'm not going to make a big impact on Big Bang Theory. The world is going its way. And what I choose to do in this lecture isn't going to change very much the way that picture of the Big Bang but Dao, the great Tao goes. And nothing that I do that affects the inside of my mind or body is going to affect very much the way that subatomic physics works either. My range of concern in my normative choices is going to be more limited than that. But it's still very, very broad. At one level, it's quite clear that when I'm choosing a behavior or an activity or a thing to do or a path that is available to me because of modern science, I can do something about the level of platelets in my blood. I can take a certain medication. I can eat certain foods. I can engage in certain activities or exercises that will affect 
those little tiny cells. I can't do subatomic physics, but I can affect that. I can make choices. When I this and not that, when I pick one path rather than the other, I don't eat that cake and I do eat that iron-filled Wheaties dish. That is making a, dis a difference in my platelet levels. At the other end, when I make a decision about whether or not to fly back to Vermont for the summer, I'm making a decision that impacts on the ecosphere on the entire bio, the, on the biome that we all inhabit together and on which we all depend, of which our life is a part. And when we make a decision, we are making a decision literally every time from all of these points of view. So Taoism is not individualism, it's not selfish. There's a verse that was a, a famous selfish Taoist who thought it was all about just egoism. It is not about egoism. It's also not about just utilitarianism, not just about humans. It is about everything in this range. So that's what I want to say about Taoism, but I do want to say a little bit more about this other subject of mine that has been sitting around in the middle of everything I've said so far. And that is about conceptual schemes and different ways of thinking and dealing and being in the world. I mentioned earlier that uh, I was rejecting, for, this is when I was a postdoc, so it was very early in my career, that I decided to reject that idea that Basically, if I use a Chinese English dictionary, I'm learning the meaning of the terms. And when I began to do that, I began to look around at a technique called radical translation. And I used it for the first half of my career. The picture I'm showing you now is what I would call a kind of the territory that as an undergraduate major in philosophy, I had to know my way around. And notice I'm using the notion of way and paths. And notice there are paths. I know how to get from a concept like reason to a concept like free will, to a concept like thought, to a concept like argument and logic. I know my way around this territory. And this territory has a structure. Reason lies very, very close to the core of it. Let me see how much of philosophy I can find in ancient China. And so I started writing papers. And I brag that I've written over 100 of them, and I have. But a lot of them are just about this negation. I just kept discovering, using this technique, that in Chinese, I can't find all of the concepts that are black. And the best I can find is something a little bit like in some ways, those that are dark gray and some that are a little bit more like those that are light gray. And then there's something that's kind of like the ones that are white, but it's a completely, uh, you want to think, okay, these words still mean the same thing. And what I want to convince you, what I want to leave you with, because I'm not going to go through the whole argument is, now it's wrong to think that Chinese thought is just about these little pieces left around out there. The way to think about this map, and this is called a mind map, the way to think about this map is the way we think about space. There are some big, there are black holes, and they warp space and time so that light has to travel in a certain direction. Light's shortest path is going to be curved because of the shape of space-time. This concept structure and the ones that are bigger and closer to the center are like that. They shape the reasoning space around a certain area. And if we try and understand Chinese philosophy by thinking that we're still in this space, you will not get it and you will not see what it is that's going on in Taoism. And it will always seem to you like what I was over and over again accused of doing, saying, oh, Chinese people can't reason. They're really irrational. They're really not philosophers and so on. And that's not what I want to say. What I want to say is they live in a different conceptual space. And their space is warped around this concept of a natural Tao. And all of their other concepts go through that. And when I understand that, then I can see what Yen Fu was doing. It's no problem, once I understand this conceptual space, plugging Western philosophy right into the middle and saying science is a social Tao. It's a social Tao that helps me understand natural Tao. 
and therefore can inform my behavior and help me make good moral choices. Thank you. That's all I have to say today, unless you have questions. Thank you so much, Professor Hansen. In China, we always clap back. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it, was, it was something that Mao Zedong uh, uh, pioneered, but we still do it. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to open it up to the students first on the panel, if any of our students have any questions for you. Hannah, go ahead. First of all, thank you so much for your enthusiastic lecture. That was really helpful. Um, a question I was wondering is, given the complexities of language that you discussed today and also in the Watercourse Way reading that you recommended, which we all very much enjoyed, by the way, what do you think is the best method of studying um, philosophy written in classical Chinese or generally a language one does not know, an attempt to most fully grasp its meaning or its meanings? That is to say, is there any course of study or tips that you have to offer someone studying a philosophy in translation or a philosophy originally written in a language they do not speak, understanding any nuances that might not be clear. Yeah, aside from remembering this slogan that you should not assume that every meaning is going to be an English language word, uh, recognize that you really must understand how that language works for its ordinary speakers. And it was something that I learned when I landed in Hong Kong and I was, you know, I'll brag. I was a good student. I learned a lot of words and I could, I could, I had good musical ear. I could do the pronunciations, but I found that whenever I said something, it was just unnatural. It's not the way you say that. And here I was translating my English into Chinese and it never worked. And I thought, because Chinese is in fact very difficult, but I realized it's difficult for me. I'm a 20 year old, American trained in, in German and Spanish and English. And I come to Hong Kong and I'm thinking I'm going to find a language that's like what I learned before. And it's not like that. So I say, well, it's really hard because it took me the longest time just to get over the first hump, the very fact of tones. How many of you studied Chinese? Right? So you've got, you've got 11 tones in Cantonese. When you say a word, you have to say it at the right pitch and in the right direction and at the right level and for the right den length. Uh, otherwise, it's not the same word. It's as different as bed and bat. Uh, and if I say yan and I say yan, uh, people will be confused. They're not the same word in Chinese. So what I did, and, and this is something you can only do in certain circumstances, but if you really, really want to learn a language and learn how it works, what I decided was, this is not really a hard language. And you know how I know it's not a hard language? All the three-year-olds around me in the street are speaking it fluently, constantly. It's a language a three-year-old could learn. So I started to talk to young children constantly and only to young children to see how they use because one of number one their tones are clear and pure just ring out you can't miss them number two they use all of the since you have to use the tone of your voice for meaning you can't use it for emphasis and for your attitude and for sarcasm and surprise and so you add words to the end of the sentence kids use that just so naturally it's just you just feel you just feel them doing it you get the feeling from them and then they take this very small bundle of resources they don't know I actually knew more words than most of them did, but they took a much smaller vocabulary and much smaller core, and they knew how to put it together to say anything they wanted to say. And I said, okay, if I can learn to do that, then I can take these other things I know, pack them on, but doing that is doing what I showed you in the last slide. It's looking at the language the way a child does and using it the way a child does to navigate your social space, to play with your friends, to interact with your parents, to get a drink of water, to take a taxi. You learn the language by doing things in it. So that's my advice. Uh, you can study, of course, and you should study the grammar and the words and the vocabulary and the pronunciation and be corrected and all of that. But if you really, really want to feel a language, go there and talk to the kids. It's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, let's move on to um, some of the Q and A. Um, one question here is: Would you distinguish the late Wittgenstein's notion of way of life from your use of religion? Um, Wittgenstein's. I I went back because I thought he was in fact sounding that much like a Taoist. He calls it the form of life. He says that language is a game played that comes with a form of life, uh, which is which is much more platonic sounding. But yeah, I think it make it way of life. And I would say that's exactly what I'm talking about. But that is that way of life is the social Tao. The social Tao includes language and the Confucian view that the, the view of the human Tao is a view of how language is part of intertwined with all the features of our social life, all the roles, all the responsibilities and behaviors and so on. Taoism and science take that more broadly. And I would think that science, I think I've said this before, the basic theory I want to propose here is science is a social Tao. It's a way of life that consists in cooperation with others to find out the, the paths in nature. And in that social Tao, there are no performative authorities. Einstein's an authority, but not because he declares what the truth is. Einstein is an authority because he knows better than I do what the lay of that land is. And his authority comes from the way nature actually operates. So being in that scientific social Tao is being in a social Tao that is completely managed by the idea of a way of life in nature that is discovering nature's paths and the possibilities for us. And when we make decisions, for example, about pandemics, we really need to be following the science because the science is telling us how you get out of a pandemic and save the lives of your family and grandparents and so on. Another question. Um, this was terrific. It started with a compliment. Um, thank you, thank you. About the Dow, how does this apply to the current political situation in the PRC? As you may know, answering that question could get me in trouble because right now I'm colluding with foreign elements. So I will say only that clearly there is a Chinese conception of society that has part of what my teacher and we are struggling against is whether you take this Confucian idea of a single ruler and everybody follows that ruler whom we take to be very wise and do what he says because he's the ruler or whether we are all involved in making decisions and that our decisions together matter. What you hear coming out of China is an outgrowth of this fact that you, this area that we're talking about is thought of as being teaching. It's about education. So if you get people who are being misguided, what you must do is re-educate them. From our point of view, that's brainwashing and that's going to be a violation of our sense of autonomy and individualism. But there is something in Chinese culture that makes sense of the fact that people are misbehaving, you educate them better. Um, I happen to believe there's a lot of truth in this because when I raised my son in Hong Kong, I was constantly aware of how much freedom I had to let him stay out until nine or 10 o'clock at night and just come back when he felt like it because we have almost no crime here. If I lived in Denver or I lived in Baltimore or New York or even Salt Lake City, I'd be worried about letting my son stay out till 10 o'clock at night. And it is not because there are more laws here than there are in New York, not because they throw more people in jail here than in New York. They don't. It's because here people are educated with this sense of social responsibility and cooperation. We wander these streets where 100,000 people per square mile. We don't bump into each other. We dodge and weave. You don't have bullies on the street. If you had bullies on the street, it would be chaos. So there's a way that the Chinese people have functioned to cooperate and work together 
for thousands of years, and they are still doing it. They do believe that education is the key to it, and that may seem to us to be kind of overweening, over, overwhelming, overweening, because it doesn't give you enough autonomy. I think there's a way to make our argument within that context, but you can see what from China's point of view, they're thinking they have to do. They don't want to have terrorism. They think that the Uyghurs represent a threat of terrorism. They're going to try and re-educate them. That seems to me to be connected to this way of looking at the world. Thank you. Um, another, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Nathy, go ahead. Um, I have a question regarding sort of like uh, the concept of like awareness in Dao, because it seems like it underscores a lot yes. of like the interactivity and stuff. So like, yes. can you speak to a little bit about to awareness slash consciousness even? Yeah, as, yeah, especially you you see it in Buddhism, but it is also, it's in Zhuangzi, you get it everywhere. Uh, awareness is just part of that sapience. That notion I gave you at the very beginning, it's a matter of being alert to, you've got your conscious intelligence focused on where you are and what you're doing. You remember the Star Wars slogan, never his mind on where he is, what he is doing. My counsel I shall keep as to who is a Jedi and who is not. Uh, be aware of where you are, what you're doing, how, how, what the layout is, what other people are doing. You can anticipate what they're doing and you can cooperate or you can at least not interfere with what they're doing. It is that kind of being in the moment. And that's basically what you find in the, the, the form of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, that is Taoist inspired consciously focused on where you are, what you're doing. Don't be thinking about nirvana. Don't try and think in great Tao terms. Don't try and think about your subatom. Think about the things you can control, where you are, what you can do, how your body can move. And that awareness just is knowing. We, the, in Chinese, it's just called knowing. Or you can then have lots of synonyms, clarity, uh, perception, uh, waking up. When you're asleep, you're not doing that, obviously. When you wake up, that's enlightenment, right? And that, that was a follow-up question I had was, what about sleep? Like, how does that, what is Tao for sleep versus Tao for, like, you mentioned the Tao for the dead, um, but yes. what is Tao for sleeping? I, I, I missed one word in there. What is Tao, what? For blank. sleep. Oh, for sleep. Oh, for sleep. Um, the amount of theory in Taoist and ancient Chinese texts about sleep is mostly that when you're asleep, uh, your knowing doesn't know, but you do sometimes in your sleep seem to be awake. You have, your, your knowing is imagining things. So your consciousness is as it were creating things. And in your sleep, you can have this experience of waking up in your sleep and still being asleep. So you can have an experience of waking up in your sleep and realizing that you were asleep before and yet you're still asleep. And then you wake up again. And Zhuangzi says, but how many times could that go on? I mean, maybe we can have a waking up from a waking up from a waking up. And each time we wake up, we're a little bit more enlightened. We come to the realization that the way we were looking at things before wasn't really the way they are. Now I see it differently. Now I say I'm enlightened. And then I wake up again and wait, I thought I was enlightened before. And now I'm really so that that's a for Zhuangzi, that's an perhaps he doesn't know, perhaps endless process. He says, perhaps there will be a great awakening when we will all realize that this is nothing but a big dream. But we don't know. What we know is dreaming and waking are examples of what it is to be enlightened. The lights come on, you see the world, you say, oh, yeah, <laughs> shake your head, get up, and you follow your way around the world with your eyes open, seeing with the natural light. Does that help? We spent we spent a little bit of time talking about the butterfly, the famous butterfly passage. In the yes. Song. Can you can you? I can't help but ask you to. I wasn't gonna <laughs> let I wasn't gonna let you go without talking about that. 
Uh, okay. Well, yes, I'm afraid I have a few articles. No, the butterfly dream is a is a big issue because people look at that and, and it's a version of the English is the only real language to say Western philosophy is the only real philosophy. So you look at that passage and you think, oh, this is just like uh, Descartes and Barclay. This is just like, oh, well, life is just a dream. It's like the Matrix. And Zhuangzi is saying something like how everything is just a dream. The problem is that in Descartes, the dream comes at the beginning of his reasoning. In Drongza, it's the very last passage in the chapter. It's after he's been talking about all these different perspectives that you may occupy in life and how when you see things from a larger perspective, you experience that as waking up as seeing things better, understanding better. So it's the way that we see that Drongza is not a skeptic in the sense he doesn't think there's knowledge. He thinks there's knowledge, but it's always capable of the next stage of improvement. And we do tend to think of it as improvement. When, when, the, when the Lord of the River ends up at the Eastern Sea, he says, oh, now I'm enlightened because I'm, I realize what bigness really is. And before, I thought that mine was the largest water in the world. And the Lord of the Sea says to him, no, wait. In comparison to the whole world, this sea is nothing but a little drop. And when you get to the highest level, you will be, then you will be truly enlightened. And when Drongza tells his story, it's a way of illustrating the fact that those moments of awakening each feel like we've improved on our knowledge before. But how do we know it's an improvement? How do we judge if we actually know better or just know differently? I think what the butterfly dreaming is, dream is saying, what if when you woke up, you found it equally good to think of, oh, now the butterfly has just gone to sleep and is now dreaming that he's Drongza, rather than thinking, oh, I just woke up from dreaming I was a butterfly. The fact is that these two are symmetrical, he thinks. It's natural to think of waking up as being, oh, now I'm aware, and before I wasn't. But the butterfly dream says, you can't be sure. It could be symmetrical. It could be that you were knowing both times, and they were just different ways of knowing. Thank you. That's actually very, very clarifying. Um, so thanks for that. I'm glad I asked. Um, oh, Nikki, go ahead. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking with us, Professor. Um, I don't want to be too political, but I'm grappling with the idea of being able to control everything we do and the Tao, but also wanting change and the relationship between social change and personal responsibility, which I think is what the Tao really encourages is you to think for yourself, but also consider your actions have consequences. So how does that relate? And is there a way to, yeah, to work with those two things together? There, there's a way of putting them together and it, but it's not going to be giving you certainty. It's one of the things about Taoism. I said, the skepticism is always there. You're never going to be sure what the impact of your behavior will be. You have to be as aware as you can of it, but because we, because of this possibility of a chaos type thing where you might do that one thing that tilts America to go back to Trump say, or you might do that one thing that really moves us in the direction of dealing with racism and sexism and the other problems we're trying to deal with. You can only make the best judgment that you can make from where you are the opportunities and options that are available to you, and importantly for Taoism, the preparation you have, because it's about what have you learned? What behaviors, what capacities, what skills do you have to bring to this situation of these opportunities? Preparation make, meets opportunity. You can pick a direction. And when you do that, you march the universe down one of the available paths. And there's no marching back. And you don't know for sure where it's going. It seems to be going in the right direction, but Taoism is a meta-ethic. It's not an ethic. I don't have 
your answer for you, except that you have to remain kind of humble and careful and alert that you might make the wrong decision here. Try and make the best one you can. I'm sorry, I can't tell you more, but we don't have a God in Taoism. Okay, let's go on to a, uh, another audience question. <clears throat> uh, at least a couple more. We have time for a couple more audience questions. Uh, one is um, self-described as a more far-fetched question. Can you elaborate on Yijing and its relation to Taoism? Uh, yes, I can. The, um, the, the notion of Taoism was an invention uh, of a historian who lived about 200 or more years after both Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi. So we know that Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi didn't think of themselves as Taoists at all. In fact, nobody outside of that Confucian Moist group seemed to think of themselves as belonging to some kind of group. They were all just thinking about how do we get guidance in life? How do we solve these problems? How do we work together to achieve this or that? Uh, when this historian looked back on the classical period, he invented, he had the Confucians and the Moas. Those were two schools that really were a kind of association, a kind of grouping, a kind of school of people who worked together. He named four other schools. One of them he called the Taoists, the Dao Jia. The other one he called Fa Jia. They're translated as a legalist, but if I'm right, they were not really talking about law in the Western sense of law, uh, but I won't go into what they were talking about instead. And you have the Ming Jia, who were the ones that we sometimes call logicians, but literally just means a school of names, the school that's talking about names. And then you have Yin Yang Jia, and that is a school of naturalism that had the theory of Yin and Yang Qi, the five elements, and he called them the yin yang jia. In the Han, everything was kind of unified under a Confucian orthodoxy, and all those were pulled together. At the end of the Han, a, a, a scholar named Wang Bi put together the version of the Tao Te Ching that we all now read. We think of that as the original version, but it's actually a version. We don't have the original version. We have a version from after the Han. When he did that, he was working on the theory that the Tao Te Ching and the Yi Jing were basically the same system. So he put in his interpretation to that translation, to that uh, combined text, he put in the interpretation that linked it up with yin and yang and wuji and daji so that it becomes tied in entirely with the yijing. And they sit together for a long time. And the way to think of that is the orthodox way of thinking about that is the Taoists are committed to yin-yang theory. The way I think about it is yin-yang theory was at the time the best theory they had of the structure of nature. That's why I think that Yen Fu and Jin Yuelin and these other Taoists who came along and said, hey, look, there's another theory of nature. They immediately glommed onto it because they're not committed to yin-yang theory as the core of their way of viewing things. It was something that was at the time the best theory they had about how nature operates. And they thought that the yin and the yang theory was a theory about how nature operates. I should say in addition that this use of yin yang theory and this commitment they had to naturalism produced in China what was what everyone acknowledges and you can go and read about this in uh, Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization in China, the most advanced civilization in the pre-modern world. Before the invention of science and industrialism, China was way ahead of the West in terms of its technological and political sophistication. And it came from basically this way of being naturalists and thinking about it in young terms. There's a better way to think about it. So I think Taoists are not fully, fully committed to it and shouldn't be. It was the way they thought about it when it was blended at the end of the Han Dynasty. The Yi Jing, I could say one other thing about it because I have taught it in classes and like teaching it. It's often thought of as a kind of prediction vehicle like tarot cards, but it really isn't about prediction. If you read the Yi Jing carefully, you will see that what it should be about is guiding your life. When you throw 
when you throw the sticks or if you use the coins or even if you use dice or if you just use a random number generator on your Excel sheet, doesn't really matter. The point is before you do the random activity, you come up with a practical question like, should I date this girl or should I date this boy? Should I study this or should I? You have a question in your mind about what you should do. Then you roll the dice and you get the answer to your question. It's not a prediction about the future. It's a way of getting an answer to a practical guidance question. And that part of it is quite Taoist. It's not, by the way, the best way to get an answer to a question, but <laughs> I've found with experience that it does make you think about what you're, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to meditate before you make a serious decision. Uh, and it will often give you good advice, perhaps randomly because it's been used for so long, uh, but it's going to be so vague that you will have to interpret it. And you'll have to say, what does this advice mean? But when you think about that, it'll make you think about that practical issue you're facing in a more careful way. Okay. Now let's go to um, a clarif clarificatory question. We love these. Um, uh, could you touch a bit more on Lao Tzu's language paradox and how that arises in the Tao Te Ching and um, We'd like to better understand the what the confusion there is that you mentioned, which Schwanza overcame. Okay. Um, let me see if our time, I, I, I won't take too long with this. Let me just say it briefly. Uh, in the way that Zhuangzi sets it up in his history, Shundao comes up with this situation that's seen to be paradoxical. It's paradoxical for this very reason. Abandon knowledge is an instruction to you. It is a bit of teaching about something you should do. And if you follow it, you disobey it. Okay, so that's, we can call that a prescriptive paradox. And that's the paradox that Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu faced. Now, Lao Tzu didn't like the idea of Da Dao. The idea for Shun Dao, he gets this kind of fatalistic conclusion. He doesn't like the idea that it's a Dao for the dead. So he doesn't want to have his Tao be all, go through all time. The time in the future must be open to my Ziran, to my self-realization. And so he wants to make a conception that is like Shandao. He, he said, it is said, he likes the sound of what Shandao is saying. Abandoned knowing seems to him to be a way of saying, don't follow the social Tao of Confucius or Mozza. And he likes that sound. So he wants to find a way to understand abandoned knowing without being committed to fatalism. And the way he works out, in my view, is this. He starts out with something that Mozza himself had talked about. It's part of what goes in the school of names. All names come in opposites. That is to say, to have one thing is to have what it is not. So if you have a child, you will say at some point, hey, my child has, knows the word for cat, or that's his word for cat or for fish. And I remember saying of my son, who is now the father of my first grandson, that, oh, he knows the word for fish because he goes in the, and he says, yawi, uh, yoku, yoku, yoku. And I said, okay, that's his word for fish because he uses his finger. He's learned from us about pointing. And he says, yoku. So he's talking about fish. And then a little while later, I say, well, he's got his word for fish. So show us, see. And he points to something that is not a fish and says, yoku. And now I said, no, okay. I, I, I take it back. He doesn't know the word for fish, even if it's a different word unless he uses it of fish and doesn't use it of not fish. He has to understand fish and not fish together. You have to understand male and female together. You understand, Lao Tzu says, before and after, higher and lower, being and non-being. You understand them in relationship to each other. Mozart called this relationship of these two opposites a bien, a distinction. When you learn language, you become capable of making a distinction. 
you become capable of making a distinction and then you will be corrected by your teachers and your parents and your older brothers and sisters until you make that distinction correctly. So I'm going to keep going at him until he only picks out fish or only picks out cat with this word. So the distinction is a single distinction and it has two names attached to it. And invariably, this is the Confucian insight, with those names, I also assign a value. For Lao Tzu, the main way he liked to talk about this is using the distinction between beautiful and ugly. They are, again, two sides of the same coin. And if I think about this purely on the grounds of a distinction, then I will say, yes, I can teach you as an art professor, I can tell you what is beautiful and what is ugly by making this distinction over and over again and showing you different painting scrolls and saying this one's beautiful and that one's ugly. And you may learn that distinction perfectly. And then I say, I am so proud of you. I will let you take one of my paintings home. It's yours because you've done so well. And you go up and you pick up one of the paintings that you had called ugly and smiling in pride and satisfaction, you roll it up to take it home. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Lao Tzu says, there's something I forgot. Knowing those terms is not merely knowing how to make the distinction the way your elders in society makes the distinction, but it's also knowing to prefer the way your society wants you to prefer. He calls this getting a social desire. So when you learn a term like the distinction between A and a B and a C, you are also creating desires for an A. There's no real difference there, but the proper way of learning that term is to learn that A is higher, better, should be valued more. So Zhuangzi is saying your society is programming you not merely with a way of viewing the world and dividing it into parts, but also with a system of your desires. He calls these artificial or social desires. And when you act on that system, using those terms, making that distinction, having those desires, that's called way. And you should give up weighing. Weighing is acting on social constructs. And that's what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't be acting on a social construct. That, for him, is a way of achieving freedom. Freedom from social domination. Because if you act on these social constructs, you will find that your desires and your attitudes and your beliefs is being shaped by your society. It's not you doing it. And you want to be the one doing it, so you get free from society by forgetting this whole system. Forget the names, forget the desires, forget the distinctions, and just operate in nature the way you would if you were a little baby. How does the contradiction arise? Well, I've just taught you a theory, right? It's a theory that if Lao Tzu teaches it properly, makes you want to have natural desires and not social desires. Wants you to be controlled naturally and spontaneously and not by a social system. And yet, in the very act of believing it and acting on it, I am weighing. And Lao Tzu formulates this. He says, Wu Wei or Wu Bu Wei, you don't weigh, and yet you cannot help weighing. So you have to weigh. And once you see that you can't really get away from language. Now, the Moas formulated the paradox. The paradox is the Moas say all language is bad, is bad. Saying all language is bad is bad. And it's bad for the same reason that this sentence is a lie, is paradoxical. If you say all language is bad, then what you just said is bad. You shouldn't say it. If it's not bad, then it's okay to say some language is okay. Some language is permissible. And that's what gets Strong's started. Actually, all languages are permissible if they are spoken. If that's the language that's spoken in this community, then that's the way to speak. And that, that's that's permissible. That's a, a, a meaningful sentence in that language. So that's how Zhuangzi gets around it. Does that help? That makes sense? I 
have to look at my own chat screen and see if there's a positive response to that. I think that uh, certainly helps. Um, it's, it's, it's more detail. I know that I've compressed a long lecture into a much shorter one. But. Well, you know, over there in Hong Kong, you're just getting started. Um, this is your morning, and we are uh, finishing up our day here uh, in the, well, I guess some of us are in different time zones, but we'll pretend we're all in the Pacific. <laughs> So um, it's time for us to go. We really appreciate uh, um, your being with us and, 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 and all of these uh, insights. And I, I, I just checked that the, the person who asked for the clarificatory question says, yes, it helped. Thank you. So. Um, well, thank you all for doing the honor of, of, of attending. I, I do feel honored and thank you so much. We hope someday to host you here in person. Um, I would love that. My son is in L.A., so I'll, I'll go down there a lot. He's trying to become an actor. Oh, well, noted. Noted. Both <laughs> I'll keep an eye out for, for both okay. of you. Okay. Uh, uh, please have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Let me remind you that on May 4th is our very last event of uh, this year's series, so we hope to see you there. Um, and uh, everybody be safe. Stay healthy. Thank you all.